What is going on, everybody? Episode 101. I am in Chicago, Illinois with my boy, Tuan Bibbs. Mr. Tuan, man, how are you doing? Man, doing great, man. Doing great. I appreciate you for having me. Yes, sir. And I want to get right into it, man. Like, you call yourself the Animal King, and I need to know, like, what is the deal with that? That is a pretty hard name, man. Where'd you come up with that? Uh, honestly, dude, I was. I remember sitting there because I didn't think of any nicknames uh, beforehand. I was in. I was waiting on my my bout to start. I was um, the way at Cicero Stadium for Total Fight Challenge. What they do it is whoever's next up, they go up the stairs and they wait for, for them to finish before they hop in the ring. So I'm sitting there and uh and I'm thinking, and I'm not really thinking, I'm just mind to set on a fight. And if the announcer comes up to me like, hey, uh, what do you want to be called? And I'm just like, and the first thing that came to my mind was the animal thing. I mean, it's a little bit more of a story behind it, but the first thing that came to mind, I'm in love with animals, dude. At one point in my life, I was actually vegetarian for about five years. My dad's actually still vegan to this day. We watched the video. It's called Food for Thought. It's like, it shows like how food is actually processed and like, like the camps, they put these uh, animals through with the slaughters and stuff like that. So we both went like cold turkey. And like, I remember like sixth grade and up until like my freshman year of high school, I ended up converting back to meat just because I, I wanted to put on more weight. I would walk around like maybe 125 soaking wet. And in order to play like football, wrestle and stuff like that, and, you know, basketball, you just need to be a bigger guy. So I had the height, but I didn't have the size to it. So I went back to eating meat, unfortunately. But I do see myself one day in the future going back to the maybe vegan role maybe after my fighting career is over with but you know workout career depending on how that goes i'm just fascinated with animals like you'll see me sitting down on netflix watching just different wildlife videos on like tigers like just mauling gazelles and stuff like that i just like the whole aspect of animals and then i guess the king part is just my ego i always want to be the best at everything i do you know i'm a competitor at heart and i like to go in like if i go in there's, no matter what I do, I'm one of those guys that you can we can be playing heads or tails. I want to win every single time, no matter what it is. You put a competition in front of me, I go I go hard. You went hard on November 21st. You made your amateur MMA debut. There, you don't give me a lot to talk about for that fight. I mean, it was over before it started, <laughs> um, and, and, and and quite honestly there's nothing different you could do about that fight. It was perfect. Um, you went in there, one shot, one kill, took care of business, and your opponent's sleeping inside the first 15 seconds of the fight. I mean, when you go to bed at night and you're visualizing your Amy debut, I think everybody visualizes something similar to that. Or if you're a jiu-jitsu guy, maybe choking out somebody. It was very, very impressive, yeah. but I got to know, like, Everything leading up to that moment, people only saw you for 15 seconds, but this is something that I know you had been preparing for for years, probably outside of camp. So you talked earlier about, you know, being an athlete. So what was that switch that made you decide, like, you know, what, I want to try this whole fighting thing out and see what's up with that. Like, talk to me about making the transition into the world of mixed martial arts and then doing this competitively. My dad came and picked me up from my mom's house one day and, uh, and we went straight to this to the gym, um, Taylor Park, but this is before, on, back when it was on uh, State Street. Uh, so he picked me up. I guess my brother was having trouble in school. He was getting bullied or something, something along those lines. It's so long ago. And he threw me in the ring. And from there, I've been boxing ever since. I mean, I've, like, you know, any absolute, you go through those phases where you do something for a year, take a couple months off, do it for two years, take a year or two off. But that's kind of been my flow with boxing up until the age of like 17 and then I took I took it all the way off until I turned 23 and that's when I came back into the fighting world and it was all because I was doing um I was picking food up and I in the MMA gym I was going to just happened to, well the gym I started going to just happened to be next door and I was picking some food up and I walk it as I was walking back to my car I see these guys wrestling and throwing bodies around and as a competitor as a fighter I'm like oh shit uh oh snap i don't know if i can use the you can you can you, know, you can be you yeah. man and i was like oh shit what the fuck is going on over here so i look and then there's this one big guy like uh his name was ryan like uh shoulder like brock lesnar traps mm -hmm. you know going on and i'm like oh okay this is the guy i want to look at and then he weighs me in 
And I was like, all right, hey, let's go. And I w- walked in and um, and then from there, I signed up and I've been going to, the, went to that gym for about a year and some change. But if we're going way back, uh, yeah, I think I started actually going into competitions back at the age of 11. So I trained off and on from 6 to 11. Then I had my first boxing competition at the age of 11. And then from there, what Chicago boxing is a little different from like other stuff. It's like each gym is kind of a park district gym. They're all like kind of connected in a way where all the coaches know each other. And you pretty much spar like the ties like every week. It's like it was like a competition every week. Like every week I was in a different gym. For the most part, sparring, I didn't have too many sanction fights. I've only had two boxing sanction fights, but I've had these little wars we would do with like you go to these boxing uh, park districts and you'll every week you'll fight. Every like, like in week. smokers? Like a smoker thing. So yeah, I've had maybe about 45, 50 smokers. Wow. And I'll just go. Yeah. So I was, like every week it was different kids. And then it's like um it turned to like uh have you ever heard of like um that last man in the cage how i forget the name they referred to but it's almost like a like a hell in a cell like one guy mm-hmm. stays in and every round they're throwing new motherfuckers at you so I, I got to the point where that was me i was like laying these kids out every round just laying them out left and right and then bring another kid and i'm like all right next pile lay them out to the point i was just wiping out the gyms what made you decide to like pivot away from the world of boxing then into mixed martial arts obviously very different Mixed martial arts, you have to know about grappling, jujitsu, uh, clinching, all that other types of stuff. Like, why not go into competitive boxing? Like, what made you decide MMA specifically? So it's a little two-part story to that. So um, the, the first wave when I left boxing was uh, so about the age of, I want to say, 13, um, maybe 12 or 13. So right after I really just started, got going with my amateur career with boxing like I I think I had at this point I had my second second sanction fight but with all like the um sparring everything in there I was like I was in the up and then it, we I was wrestling every morning well this is like street wrestling every morning before school like the sixth graders seventh graders eighth graders were all just like me in the like yard and we just like crazy shit whatever you've seen on WWE the day before like jump off the gates onto these like abandoned mattresses. I'm probably not the most sanitary thing to do in the world. We we're like jumping off gates, jumping off poles. And I remember getting on, jumping on top of the gate, trying to do a swanton bomb on two dudes. And they both caught me in the air, one leg on each arm. And like, I don't know exactly how it happened, dude. It was like a split second, but I came down on my leg and I broke my tibula and fibula straight in half. So I handled it like a champ, you know, I was like, I was that tough kid. Dude. I was like made of bricks hard of steel and then like you know just sat there lasted off and then you know the paramedics came banished me up and I was out for about it took me about honestly about seven weeks to heal wow I didn't go through and I when I was back out like just back training but my heart at that point wasn't in it anymore I don't know if it's just the time off but I remember like maybe four months after the incident happened there was this one dude, I used to piece him up. He was from Fuller Park. I forget his name. But his name was from Fuller, he was from Fuller Park. And it was one of the guys I used to spar with often. And like, like he couldn't hold a candle to me. I remember getting back in the ring and he just like gave me the work, like whooped my ass. And I was like, and it kind of like, I want to say discouraged me. It was like a 12 year old kid. I'm like, fuck, like I used to be the top of the park district world. Like all the new kids, on, like I was the new kid on the block that whooped everybody's ass. And I was like, I, I don't know if my heart's in it. Not. So I started like transitioning transitioning to like other sports like track and stuff like that. I just took some time off uh, from like 13 up until like 17. Mm-hmm. And I made a brief comeback at 17. And uh, only smokers at that point. I didn't do any sanction fights after then. I hit a couple of smokers. And then from there, like I uh, kind of started the college role. And then I started traveling from work. And then right when I finished, when I finally came back to Chicago at 21, my boxing coach had retired. And, then I, and I was one of those guys that I didn't really trust other boxing coaches because I've seen a lot of people in the boxing world who had terrible careers because they had like didn't have the greatest coach. And like uh, I didn't want to be that guy that like to shop around for boxing coaches and I think I know more than the coach did. And I just started transitioning to like fitness and like just staying healthy. And then when I like went to MMA, I'm like, okay, I really don't know anything about MMA. So now I don't think I can know more than the coach. I 
my ego won't get to me. I'll be a humble kid getting smashed every day until I get better. That is fascinating that you are able and willing to like put yourself out there into the unknown like that. Um, you, 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 you said a little bit like, oh, I'm the animal king because I got an ego. But what you just said, that kind of contradicts what that because you you wanted to be a student. And when you're a student and when you're trying to learn something, that's like the most selfless thing you could be because you're going into something saying like, you know what, I don't know a lot, but I want to learn. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to be the least skilled guy in the room. I'm willing to be the guy that everyone gets their at. Everyone takes a turn whipping my ass. I'm willing to be that guy. And for you to do that, particularly yeah. coming from a sport that you dominated on the local scene, that must have hurt the ego when you're first getting started. There must have been a few times you're just like, damn, man, like, I'm not used to this. I'm not used to all this, like, losing. I'm not used to getting ragdolled like this. <laughs> yeah, I think that's when the jiu-jitsu came in. Like, I've always had, like, a lot of top strength. So even as a white belt, I was able to kind of hang with the blue belts. And I wasn't going to say, not really want to say hang with the purple belts. Because at a certain point, you know, it's purple belts, but purple belts, they earned that belt. But the blue belts, I'm able like, to use my strength to kind of like hold them and then kind of slowly work my way into transitions. Well, with the stand up, even coming to MMA world, I did feel a little bit, I had an edge when it came to everything but the kicks, you know. And then that was just really like learning my distance. You know, I, I learned that if I get close to a guy, he really can't throw that many kicks. So if I get up on his ass, I take away an element of his, you know, his game. I mean, obviously, you don't want to do that with no Tyson Fury or, you know, somebody that can. Yeah. You know, or no, I'm sorry, Tyson Fury is not the guy. Like a France Nagano, who you get too close, he's going to put you to sleep. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can, I would say that first 30 seconds, even like the first 15 seconds, you can kind of tell somebody's skill level just based off their reactions, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was able to kind of get in with those guys and like kind of take over with just the hands alone. I get, I get outmatched the kicks, but with the hands, I kind of can work my way. Especially at the AMI level, I think you need less time to realize, to recognize when there are skill gaps. So for, so what I mean by that is like when you watch a Bellator fight or a UFC fight, commonly, yes, there is going to be a gap, but when you're looking at two high level athletes, it takes a little bit longer to start seeing the gap. What I mean by that, you put Cyborg up there against a top ranked 45 er in her weight class. Yes, you'll see a gap, but it's going to happen like within like the first 45 seconds or so, then you'll start seeing like, oh, wow, her footwork's way more advanced. Her head movement's so much better. Her, 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 her uh, jab is that much crisper. It snaps. At the AMI level, sometimes it takes a while to see. I know you only got nine minutes to play with. And sometimes yeah. I could watch an entire round of AMIs. I'm like, I don't know who's better right now. Um, yeah. And, and that's difficult to see. For you you didn't give me a lot to watch because you've only fought one time. And like I said, you knocked the kid out right away, but I'm not used to at an any level seeing some guy pull a Terrence McKinney job on somebody like that. I'm not used to seeing that. And yeah. in the aftermath of that, like you get your hand raised. I, I can only imagine like how good that must have felt getting a dub in front of your family, in front of your friends, you're fighting in Chicago. It must've been a powerful moment. Take me to the back room after that fight. Like, what's going through your mind? And how do you kind of, like, get to a point where it's like, I'm going to celebrate this win in recognition of all the hard work, but at what point do you have to flip off the switch and be like, you know what, yep, it happened, but I got to get ready again? Um, After the fight, I mean, uh, there, there was no loss in my mind. Like, there was no situation I can play out of my head that I was losing that fight. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, still shout out to my opponent. You know, I, I did think he was going to put on a good fight, but I just, like, I was confident, just like my preparation and how hard I trained around the clock that I'm going in and I was getting done. I even envisioned in my head, like, climbing on top of the ring after I get the knockout. Because in my head, I'm like, I'm, there's no way I'm not going in and getting a knockout. Even if before I, I actually had a chance to even see a picture of my opponent, just knowing the name, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting a knockout. This is my first fight. I have to go out. I have to see the knockout. I mean, I didn't plan it out to get it within the first 10 seconds of the round. I was kind of, you know, I was thinking maybe within like a minute and a half. I was because I watch a lot of um, a lot of videos on. I, I'm I'm like a I'm obsessed with dude. I saw the whole 185 division in Illinois. I looked at everybody fights, 
uh, from the number one guy to number 20 ranked guy. I got stalked everybody. I looked at everybody's videos on whatever fights are out there. There's not too many enemy fights that are out there. And I watched a couple of like B2 videos and uh, Cage Aggression with their 185 enemies, a couple of 170s and 12 fibers just to kind of see. And I've seen a, like a pattern, like a lot of people just kind of running out and like trying to go like off the back right away. And I'm like, I saw I was planning for that. And I was planning for like a patient guy. And I was just trying to balance out in between. But after the fight, you know, it was, it was definitely a surreal experience, you know. Honestly, I think I felt better than when I won all my boxing fights. I just, it felt like, I don't know what it was, but it felt like this is me. Like, I felt like, okay, I, I actually enjoy this more than I did boxing. With boxing, just raise your hand, shake the coach's hand, shake the opponent's hand, get out the ring. With that, I had like a little bit of a 30 second of my time where I'm able to scream, yell, jump on top of the cage. You don't see that too much in the boxing world until you go pro champion. So you don't really see any of that. So it's a little bit more of a wild side you can bring out when it comes down to MMA rather than boxing. And, you know, we get to I, – I, I think I calmed down finally after I took a group picture. I had almost about at least 50 to 60 people out watching me fight. I know I sold about 40 VIPs and about 20, you know, mission tickets. So after I took the picture, I think it all came to real, realization that, okay, damn, I really just went in and whooped somebody's ass. And i say five seconds from the time we got close, but 10 seconds from the time – it was 10 seconds from the time the bell rang. Hey, you know, I show love to uh, to the fighter and his coach, you know, gave him a hug. And I told him, hey, man, if you ever want to get some work in outside of the fight, you know, uh, I'm willing to go to your gym, come to my gym. We can, like, spar with 185. It's kind of hard to find. I'll say anybody above 185 to really get some work in because a lot of these guys in the May world, they're about – they're tiny, dude. They're, like, 155 minus, you know, and, and down. So it's kind of it's hard to find somebody 185 up with some actual skill to them that you can really grind out. Absolutely. And uh, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you, like from a matchup standpoint, you, it's rare that I see somebody that's, that's like built for division and you are built to be a 185 pound middleweight. Like you're perfect for it. You are absolutely perfect for it because what I don't like seeing is guys, your size that are like, I'm going to go 170. I'm like, why? fucking why why are you doing this like like dude like fight in your weight class you're gonna lose way too much strength fight at your normal weight and for you i imagine i mean you're a big dude you probably walk around at like two something but like a cut down to 85 it shouldn't be that big of a deal for you yeah honestly i've i've never cut in my life until my mma fight so with boxing well wait like the boxing like how you said the smokers you know you don't really you know, you pull up to the gym, everybody hops on a scale. The coach is literally, you got a 110 guy, I got a 108 guy, you got a 115 guy, I got a 110 guy, but he's pretty good. He could probably go get your 115 guy, you know. That's how much, that's how it pretty much was, like, little bootleg-ass scale. Yeah. And everybody just stepped yeah. on. You kind of just matched up all these kids, and, you know, and he went in. So, for me, I, I looked up a shit ton of videos. because I knew I could cut the weight. I was just trying to figure out what would be my weight range I would want to cut. So I didn't want to be like a TJ Dillashaw who cuts 35 pounds or a Conor McGregor who's cutting all that crazy, or a Habib. So I, I was trying to figure out like my bread and butter. So I did a lot of research on like how much weight is like okay to cut, you know, from your body percentage, uh, your body fat, and then your actual weight and how much is like the healthy dosage of it. And, uh, and I kind of like found that bread and butter. So I walk around about 200 pounds you gotta get a yeah. plus or minus five i'm never really dipping under 200 maybe a pound like i can get as heavy as 210 if i'm like going on a little uh, a bench eating or you know i'm out on vacation i get up to about 210 but i'm never heavier normally than about 210 and as low as 200 so i float and that for that fight i diet i have a, i'm really strict on my diet by about four five to four weeks out so i'm eating clean so I got down to about five week. I had to be that Sunday because I did the water load, the typical five day surge of water, then cut down as the days go on. So I want to say Sunday I started about 197, 198. And then honestly, dude, I, I ate the same thing I normally did. I didn't cut any sodium out until about that Wednesday. And then Wednesday is when I cut sodium out uh, halfway through the day. And then Thursday, you know, the whole one bottle of water and then Friday mornings, the weigh-ins, I'll cut weight pretty easily. It just pretty much slid off. Uh, shout out to all the YouTube guys I followed that helped me with the with the uh, 
with the with the water cut. I'm sorry I can name any of those guys. I can't watch so many dudes. I remember I did watch a Michael Bisping video about how to do it and somebody else, but it slid right off. I didn't struggle at all. I did. I felt great at weigh-ins. Not great. Nobody feels great at weigh-ins. But I didn't. I didn't feel the stumbling. The about to faint. I felt like if I had to maybe do like a, a workout, I could have got a workout in and probably still would have felt great. So my weight cut wasn't terrible. And I hydrated that, back up good. And yeah. I, it's just refreshing to hear that again, like you're fighting in your true weight class and the cut is manageable for you. Um, there are some guys I know that I won't really, I won't drop that. I won't name call them because I'm not in the business of name calling, but you know who you are. There's some guys that are fighting at flyweight, and I'm just like, bro, like, bro, like, dude, come trust on. Trust me, I know. <laughs> like, I'm I like, look at these guys. Oh man. I'm like, I dude, you're 160 guys, pounds out, outside of camp. Like, you should not be anywhere oh, near fucking fighting at flyweight. You're insane. They do it though. And it's even more, yeah, it's even more crazy for those small guys because when you look at a small guy, dude, like a guy that's fighting at 135 and they're walking around at like 170, dude, like that has to be dangerous because it's a little bit the less uh, natural weight you have, like, it's easier to cut, you know? Like, I mean, it's harder to cut because, like, a big guy who's, like, a, a two, 300-pound guy, he can cut to 265 because he just has a lot more muscle. And the more muscle you have, easier to extract water. So, like, when you get down that low, you don't got that much muscle, dude. You, you work out skin and bone. You're literally – everything from the brain is coming out. And what does that do so to I'm, your chin, too? Yo, man. Just you know imagine, what I mean? Dude. I mean, like dehydrating your body like that, oh. like, yes, like you're replenishing yourself after weigh-ins, but even so, depending on what state you're in, depending on the commission, you still can't yep. get, you can't go fucking nuts. Like you can't show up like 50 pounds heavier the next day. I know that's like biologically impossible, but you know what I'm saying? Like, like they'll, they'll be like, no dude, like this is the max you can get. Again, it depends on the state, depends on the athletic commission. And it's just yeah. like, yeah, that's great that you ate a steak dinner and got some protein, and that's great that you drank a bottle, uh, a gallon of water, but your body needs more time, and, like, you go in there, and it's just like, man, I'm not a fighter, I don't know, maybe I'm talking about <laughs> shit, but it's just like, you, you, you get a freaking, you get clipped on your jaw, man, if you were fighting yeah. at your normal weight class, you might be able to handle that compared to, Dude. you know, pulling a, a Dillashaw type move. Dude, I would love to, like, like do what the boxers doing is fight them. I walk around. I mean, I don't. I don't think my weight cut compared to like some people weight cuts is bad at all. I think it's actually on the like the more healthy side when it comes down to weight cuts. I'm only doing about ten pounds, twelve pounds. But I would love to like you know if I know who like I know I know he in the verge like the cancellation process. Like Joe Rogan speaks on it all the time. Well, like he's a big you know proponent of like everybody fighting at whatever weight class they walk around in. And I think that's honestly though whatever you can get down to without half the water cuts which you should like fight at and i think that'll take away a lot of like the health risk and everything like that because i can fight at 200 and like actually fight a true 200 pound guy i mean nobody that's coming down from 225 I, I would do that every day of the week dude i think if we had something similar to that the fights would be better anyway um, oh yeah dude. i mean like it, this is what i tell people who don't follow the sport all that close i'm just like you know, they'll walk into it and they'll be like, oh, wow, like that guy fights at 125 pounds. Like he doesn't look like 125 pounds. I'm like, well, because he's not. He hit 125 pounds the night before. He's probably closer to 140 pounds now. And people are just like, holy shit, really? I'm like, dude, like this is fighting. This is the fight game. This is they, they all yeah, game sure. the system like this. And they're like, well, that sounds kind of pointless. Then why are they doing that? And I'm just like, I don't know. It's just the way it is. I don't, I don't have the answer. It's just like, if, you know, add 10 pounds to every single weight class. And like, that's the real fighting weight. And like, it just, to me, yeah. like, why are we cutting down to 205 when you're going to show up out 215 anyway? So why not just show up on weigh-in day, make sure you're not 215 pounds and we're good, or you're not over 215. We're good. I don't know. I don't know. If it's, it's sanctioned cheating at that point, that's what it is. Not at that point. Weight cutting is sanctioned cheating. Because, mm -hmm. dude, I, I'm going to um, – I was actually going to fight two days from now at uh, the fight card. But some things happen, you know, it ended up not playing out. And I ended up changing gyms as well. So, and, like, if you look at these guys, I mean, there are some guys that walk in 
the, their normal weight. I'll say about with the AMI level, I'll say about 50%. Mm-hmm. You know, but as you get like higher up, you know, that's when pro level, m- maybe 10%, may, not even maybe 5% of those guys are, walk, are fighting at their actual walk around weight. But it's crazy. I was at the fights last uh, Saturday for uh, Total Fight Challenge. And it's just one dude, uh, he's a 185. I was looking at all the 185 when they fight. Just because, you know, you got to watch your, your meals fight. You know, you got to watch mm-hmm. the prey. You got to be out there. And if, uh, he had to guarantee probably cut from like 215, like the day before, at least. He was probably 185, maybe an hour. Like he, he was huge, massive dude. I don't know. And I'm 6'2". Yeah, I don't know. Uh how big he is I, I forgot to ask him um do you know who Derek Overstreet is he what is in, he fight out of? uh he, he fights out of Nashville MMA in Tennessee and he fights at he's fought at light heavyweight and he's he, he's currently fighting at 85 he's in the b2 fighting series and he's a professional black guy I'm bald sure. head I've seen his fights on b2 yeah for yeah sure. yeah that's Derek and uh so Derek played uh d1 college football and he was a defensive end and now he's like fighting at 185 pounds i'm just like bro like how did you do that he's just like dude i had to totally change everything in my i had to do a total body recomp in order to do this he's like it took me a long time to get down here but he did it right and i'm just like so how close are you to like 85 like when you're not training he's just like i'll put it to you this way the cut's not a big deal to me anymore he's like i'm, I'm just used to it and i've just changed some things up in my diet so i can hit this and he's probably about your size he's probably about like six one six two if i had to guess he might be a little taller than him but he's a big fucking dude it's like it might be uh uh i'm my butcher's name a jared jared come here the mm-hmm. one that just uh yeah just one with a two past weekends ago Dude, he started fighting at heavyweight. Like, well, he walked around like 250, 260. Now he's fighting at middleweight. Just imagine. Like, these dudes are cutting. Yeah. When you look at his body type, he's probably cutting from 220, maybe 215. Like, a, almost like a um, like a Paolo Costa. Like, mm-hmm. he, there are some big guys. There are some huge guys. Yeah, Cannoneer uh, is the first one I think of because he's a big freaking dude. And uh, you saw huge. him. You saw him at heavyweight and now he's like changing things up and like getting smaller and smaller but he's still like a big dude uh it's absolutely crazy but for you i want to see you stay at 85 and i gotta ask like there are so many guys out there that find success early on and they're in a hurry to move up like you're a young dude you got a lot of time on your side like what is kind of like your master plan with all of this stuff like, is the idea to stay on the AMI scene for a while? I know, obviously, everyone wants to go pro. Everyone's in a hurry to go pro. I get that. I understand it. But what's your time frame, do you think? So I, I'm a big guy. I learned from all my failures. For, you know, I, I take it to heart. You know, I think I remember um, who said it. It was um, the welterweight champion. Uh, Usman. Right. Now, U- Usman. He, he, he made a statement saying, like, you, you remember every fight that you – you don't remember all the fights that you want, all the conflicts you want, but you remember every loss. Mm-hmm. So I'm not in a rush at all to go pro. My my idea was a minimum want to be a, a purple belt. Okay. So just minimum. I would not go I would pro without having at least my purple belt. And I want to at least fight Amy for another full year. My goals, I'm 24 now. So I'm thinking I want to go around that 26 year old mark you know still fresh still young not technically in my fighter's prime yet but you know i think the fighter's prime is like that 29 to 32 ish right when they hit that prime so a little bit before my fighter's prime but i want to go in my athletic prime that way you know because you can still win a few fights athletically but you know not that fighter's prime so i want to get my purple belt for sure you know if i'm 31 i just get my purple belt that's when i'm going pro mm-hmm. but Hopefully, you know, if I train hard, you know, keep on the same route, I can get my purple belt within maybe a year and a half, two years, you know, and that's on the lighter side. You know, some people take five years for they get their purple belt, but hopefully if I go hard, I can get it in a less amount of, least amount of time. But 
minimum purple belt because you know there's some dangerous guys out there in the jiu-jitsu world and they can tear you apart so that's kind of the track i'm trying to go and, and you're playing it you're, you're playing it right you're being so smart about this because there are a lot of guys like you out there that they let those hands go they can sleep anybody but here's the thing about mma if you don't know how to stuff a takedown, if you don't know anything about jujitsu, I don't care how big you are. I don't care how strong you are. It's it, it works until you fight a really good grappler. And then guess what? Yeah. Your Tyson Fury shit that you do. No one cares. You can't do that off your back. And before you know it, it's like, well, shit, I'm a pro now. What the hell am I supposed to do? And now they're trying to like learn how to be a ground fighter and, it's too late now. And then guess where they end up? Bare knuckle. And I don't want to see that happen, man. I don't want to see that happen. Let's do it smart. Let's do it right. And it sounds like you have a really good game plan. You go pro. And I feel like in your time frame, two and a half years, roughly, like the sport's just going to get that much bigger. Like I would hope that like there are going to be additional leads. we got Habib Nurmagomedov, he just showed up with the Eagle FC. Like, Eagle I want to, yeah. I want to see more and more of these promotions get bigger, oh, more sure. popular. For sure, yeah, because that does is that helps uh, with fighter pay. More competitors. It's like you got a thousand McDonald's, you know, or a thousand restaurants you can negotiate. Or mm-hmm. there's only like UFC taking over the uh, the UFC, Bellator, and then uh, one FC. It's like it's it's hard to negotiate with with three big you know big entities so it's like okay i can go here and here but they all know what the, the market is looking like they all know okay 20 and 20 or 10 and 10 when you first starting out versus you get six six others you know ones that are just coming up they're like okay we're struggling to get fighters let's give them 50 50 and don't even worry about the win bonus 50 straight up you know so the more uh organizations the better for the fighters because you get options and you can you know have a little bit more leverage on the table. Talk to me, Tuan, a little bit about just kind of where you are in your life. And what I mean by that is you're a young dude. Most guys that are around your age are just getting out of, they're just getting out of college. They're just kind of like figuring out what it means to like be an adult and to like not have your mom wipe your ass and like figure your life out, right? Like that's what most people at your age range are are doing. Most people aren't fighting. Fighting in and of itself, I don't care what level. If you do this competitively, that's a full-time job. That right there. 100%. That's a full-time job. You have to keep your lights on, though. Like, you have to do something. So, like, what are you doing to keep your lights on? And, like, how are you able to manage all of this stuff that you're doing? Because I got to imagine you don't have a lot of free time. And I got to imagine that you're either working all the time or training all the time. Dude, I'm working and training all the time, so. I mean, for me, I grew up quick, you know, living, growing up in Chicago, you kind of, you kind of grew up quick in itself, you know? So I actually moved out my parents' crib when I was 18 and I started with the college route, but then I had a, a great opportunity at the age of 18 and to travel and work for a company called Portillo's and help them open restaurants. So I was able to go around a lot of great minds and learn a lot of business on how to run a restaurant, how to like, you know, keep the lights on in the restaurant, labor, food costs, and all kinds of different kinds of expenses. I had a lot of great mentors from the age of um, 18 up until I I finally left the company at 23, yeah, at the age of 23. So I had like a lot of, um, a lot of maturing and a lot of knowledge thrown out my way, throwing my way early. So I I always considered that was my college, you know, a lot of people go to college, they read the books. I'm, I'm nothing against college. I think college is great. But the opportunity I have to be able to work under uh, supervisors, VPs of the company, I worked close hand with the vice, couple of vice presidents that came through, the, uh, the CEOs and stuff like that, just being able to pick their brains. I had this uh, one of mentor, his name was Jeff, and, he, and all he pretty much did was uh, help start startup companies not really startup companies own startup but they were just starting out like he helped chipotle noodles and company and then he eventually got to Bertillo's. he started with chipotle noodles company when they had less than five restaurants helped him grow within the hundreds of thousands and then i met him when he came over to Bertillo's, and i was able to pick his brain almost every other day and he's helped me mature as a as a man so i got all the knowledge kind of from Bertillo's that i needed 
and now I'm in the process of trying to open my own business on the side. Um, right now, the, the name is going to be Rendezvous LLC, and then it's kind of like a kind of what Uber is doing, but more like private when like, you know, maybe picking up truckers from airports and taking them to airports and stuff like that. So I'm in the process of like working that out. And also on top of that, want to have um, like, you know, the car hop apps when you like rent out cars, like daily cars. I have two or three cars myself and I'm working in the process of getting those on the market where people can rent them out, you know, have those cars pay for themselves and then eventually sell them off like my own little mini, mini, mini mom and pop car stuff. The way to keep the income going. And then for me, I feel like it works perfectly with fighting because I have a lot of free time and not that much free time at the same time. Gotcha. That makes sense. Like the phone is always ringing, but I have more free time. To like if go to the gym and then I can go to the gym and then boom, I can answer a phone call and try to figure some stuff out. But I'm also, I also just set up my, uh, didn't finish, but I'm in the process of turning my garage into a little mini jujitsu slash weight training area. I just got some mats in. I'm in the process of cutting those mats up. I just finished setting up the squat bench rack and I got a punching bag and speed bag in there. So enough to get a, a very good sweat in and invite a couple of boys over the row, you know? And you got all kinds of things going on, man. You got that entrepreneurial glow about you. And I think that's freaking great. Tuan, Thank man, you, man. I pre- like, I just, I respect the hustle, man. I do. Like, I know this stuff's not easy. And I know that f- fighting is like one of those things where a lot of people talk a lot of shit and they're like, oh yeah, I could fight. I could do all this. And then, but this shit is not for everybody, man. Like, I, there's no it's way not- I could do it. Like, and I, I, I'm saying that, being very humble there's just no way i'm not built for that there's no way i could do that um so i have all the more respect for the people that put in the work and 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 do all the shit that you got to do in order to do this for my entertainment i appreciate you i like watching fighting i just can't imagine like all the blood sweat and tears that go into this that we don't see um the weight cut the missed family functions um not eating hamburgers not eating pizza. Uh, <laughs> That's that is the hardest part, man. <laughs> that is, dude. You be, I be like at working in the restaurant when I first started doing it, and it was the hardest part, dude. Just looking at the beef sandwich, beef sandwich, just the hot dogs, the cake shakes, and I'm just like, I gotta go in. Like I need to I, eat, mm-hmm. <laughs> but the diet. I was, but before I even started the MMA route, I was always pretty strict in my diet. So in order to combat looking at food all day. I would like meal prep. So I had always had a great meal prep plan. The work in the kitchen, you kind of get those chef skills. I'm not going to say I'm an all-star chef, but I'll call myself a super, eh, not superstar. I'll, like, if you get a D1 athlete, I'll say I was a D2 chef. Hey, I can uh, get the job done, but I can, you know, I can, I'm good at like pulling some shit out my ass. You give me some ingredients, you give me uh, a protein, some shit, uh, I can make it happen. Hey, man, that's better than most of us because I can't cook <laughs> shit, dude. I, I, I really can't. I'm terrible at it. But uh, you know what you, Go ahead. Get, get an air fryer, dude. Those, I, dude, I feel like I'm cheating sometimes when I'm cooking air fryer food because, like, it's not as greasy and it's, like, a little bit, a lot more healthier than traditional stuff. Mm-hmm. But you can cook so much in an air fryer. Oh, my God. Like, so many different chicken dish, fish meals. Oh, I, I love it, man. Ahead. I'm all about working working smarter and not harder that is me that motto was like came out of my mouth i i just haven't gotten credit for it quite yet i got to trademark <laughs> that and uh get it out there john before i let you go i want to ask you two important questions so like you're a chicago dude and when i think of chicago i think of pizza right away I think of pizza what is the best place to eat pizza in Chicago, why is Chicago pizza the best pizza in the world versus the New York pizza? Oh shit, I said it. I brought up Chicago pizza versus New York pizza. Why is your pizza better? I need to know. Oh man, pizza. Ah, uh, so we talking about mainstream. We talking about uh, what kind of pizza we talking about? Because there's so many different options. I'm you, talking you about go... like if I'm in Chicago. And I need to eat pizza and I want to know what Chicago pizza is all about because I haven't had it before. Where do I need to go? There's two places I, I love. Uh, you know, I do. I love Giordano's and I love Nancy's. 
if you're looking for some mainstream, you look like something that, you know, there's no way you can't love it, I'll, I'll tell them to go to Giordano's. But Nancy's like a little mom and pop piece of places. And uh, they got a couple locations. One is at Tinley. And I think there's one like maybe uh, New Lenox or something like that. But they're a little mom and pop piece of place. Dude, that is the bomb, dude. But if I'm going D-Bitch, I like Giordano's D-Bitch. Then they get, you got beggars and stuff like that. I wouldn't really, I wouldn't tell somebody to go to beggars unless they just want a quick slice. But Giordano's has some really good fresh pizza. You know, I just I gotta just tell you, I, I, I'm pretty partial to New York style pizza personally. Yeah. I yeah. really like it, dude. I really do. <laughs> but uh I will definitely check it out. Second question I gotta ask you is who is your dream fight against? So let's just say I can label yeah, one yeah. and, and we can make anything happen. Right now, like right now, right now. Like pro or just Amy level? Whatever. Like a lot of pro- let's just let's uh, let's shoot big, man. Let's shoot big. Let's call out Hamza right now. <laughs> I'm not fighting Hamza. No chance. <laughs> I'll fight Izzy honestly before I fight Hamza for sure. He's. I, I'm not. I do have a, a a good base to. I think I can hold somebody off from the right the takedown, but you can't hold Shemai off. There's no chance. He's you no. Know, he's going to. He's going to get a hold of you and he's going to maul you. He's just like a be. So that's what I'm working on. That's why purple belt minimum before I go in to pro level. So if I was to fight anybody right now, I'll go big, go home. I'm going Izzy. Like, Izzy on, on, right in front of me. I'll fight him in a boxing fight. I don't know about MMA. <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's wise. I think that's wise. Because you don't want that gangly dude throwing, like, head kicks at you, man. That, that's, no that's, chance. You don't want that. You don't want that. And – I really enjoyed talking to you today, Twan, and we're definitely going to have to do it again. Do you have um, a timetable for when you would like to get back in the ring and compete again? So, again, I just changed gyms. Um, so now I'm at Chicago Fight Team and, and Jiu-Jitsu at 10th Planet Lombard. So I really want – you know, I just joined about a month ago. I just left, I left my old gym. It was traveling long distance away. And I really like Chicago Fight Team. They got a lot of professional fighters through that gym. And they're just a bunch of killers, dude. So I really want to kind of like, you know, just earn the respect through those guys and kind of like just build my way up, build the trust factor. I want the coaches to trust that they can go in and coach me through a a full three to five round fight. So I'm thinking late April, early May. And at the latest June, I, my goal for this year is to get about four to six fights in. So late April, early May, and then from there, just go on a killing spree. Murder Line everybody. Smash everybody. Up. Line them, Line them up. up. Put the food on my <laughs> plate. I'm going to eat it. No leftovers. There's nothing that's going to be left at the end of the day. I love it, man. Uh, Animal King, man. You, you're an absolute legend. I want to see more of you, dude. I want to see more. I, I, I dug the 10 seconds. I did, but I want to see, like, give me a round. Let, let, give me a round next time. <laughs> I, I wasn't planning on it, man. I walked in, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to say I've seen a fear in his face, but I looked at him and he didn't look ready. I just, I, I could see in his eyes. And somebody who has tons of sparring experience, you can look in somebody's eyes and, like, he doesn't want to be in here. That's why I lay up, I'm softball, so I lay out with a straight left hand, connected on the chin, he buckled. I'm like, okay, it's time to take this to the crib. So I finished <laughs> off with the with the jab and then the right hook, and that's hey, all she wrote. And I think it's one of those things, like you know, you've been in this game long enough. Like you've you've been a combat athlete for a long time. You may only have one amateur MMA fight under your belt, but you've been in this game for a long time. I think that benefits you. I love the idea of uh, all that boxing experience. I love the idea of all these smokers that nobody's recorded. There's a lot of unknowns about you. Like I know how good you are, but like nobody else really does at this point. They're only seeing that 10 seconds. So I'm going to be really curious to see your next opponent as you start leveling up and you start taking on these jujitsu guys, these wrestler guys. Yeah. I want to see, I want to see some people sleeping. I got to see it. Yeah. So um, I, I still want to get my my foot wet. Um, so maybe one or two like warm up fights, like people around my record, and then from there, um, I want to start claiming some belts. I want to be 
I want to have at least one or two, one belt by the end of the year, and then maybe three or four by next year, and two weight classes, 185 and 205, I'm calling it. 185 champs, 205 champs. Before I let you go, why don't I give you the chance? I want you to have the opportunity to uh, shout out uh, your gym or uh, anyone that you would like to um, before we wrap. Uh, I'll do a few shout outs. So first shout out to my first gym who got me started in New Path Martial Arts in Joliet with a uh, great gym. Um, I love those guys. I wish I could have stayed. It just, uh, just, I, I just needed, um, I just need, it was my time to move on traveling and stuff like that. So shout out to those guys, shout out to Chicago fight team. Those guys like some straight killers. They just had one of the one of our guys win a, a heavyweight belt through Chicago Fight Team. Not Chicago, sorry, but Total Fight Challenge. There's absolute killers in there, dude. Like, you know, you walk in the gym, like, and it, it, we, they got killers in there. Everybody's like, you know, there's no weak souls. Everybody's killer from the kids to the adults. They're straight murderers. Then shout out to my Jiu Jitsu gym, uh, Tenth Planet. Those guys are same thing, killers. Uh, they really helped me for my for my uh, first fight, just rolling and getting smashed when they have their open mats on Sundays. There's a whole bunch of killers from every everywhere goes to Tim Planet on Sunday, and there's some absolute killers in there, you know. So shout out to those guys, and shout out to the family. Shout out to my girlfriend, and shout out to you for having me today. I appreciate you. Absolutely, my man. Uh, the Animal King will do it again.